Joe and Anthony Perino made a fortune for the Colombo crime family when they produced, they put 20,000 into a film called Deep Throat, a porn film and it made, no one really knows, 100 million, some say 250 million, millions of dollars for the mob. Their father was the uh, mafia boss, Giuseppe Perano. He was called the clutching hand. There were other clutching hands. This guy, his hand was mangled, and but he had strength in the hand. He could use it, uh, but there's been a lot of clutching hand guys. He, uh, he was tried for murder in 1919. He was brought in in the infamous barrel murders where the victim was stabbed 31 times in the chest and then thrown into a wooden wine cast and tossed into a lot on 8th Avenue in Brooklyn. That was in 1918. 1921, he was arrested and convicted for the murder of a guy named George Ferrillo. He was sentenced to death at Sing Sing. Somehow, I don't know how he got released on appeal. They had all the evidence in the world. 11 more arrests followed, and all the charges were dropped except one. Finally, Purino was murdered by a shotgun blast in 1930 when he walked towards his headquarters at 154 Sackett Street in Brooklyn. I couldn't find the building. There is a 154 Sackett Street. It's sort of a high-rise tower, so I don't think that, I think it's fundamentally the same building, but not the one he had. When he was murdered, police ran into the club. They found this guy, Joe Ferlino, uh, and they arrested him for murder. At that point, Marino, who was 24, had 19 arrests in, in a five-year period. So later on, he was cleared in the, in the murder, of course. Uh, later on, Albert Anastasia and Ferlino uh, went into the rackets together in the, on the waterfronts, shaking down laborers. In the spring of 1921, they were convicted for the 1920 murder of a guy named George Terillo, who was 34 years old. He was a dock worker, and he just refused to kick up part of his pay to these two thugs. He just refused to do it. And he said he was going to form his own labor union, and it would be an honest labor union. So they killed him. They were arrested, and they were tried, and both sentenced to Sing Sing to die. Uh, they were scheduled to die July 3rd, 1921. In May, somehow, again, they got new trials. The cases were thrown out because when they tried them again, all the victims, all the uh, witnesses were either dead or disappeared or forgot everything. So amazing. Anyway, since that, that happened, they returned to the docks, Anastasia and Florino, and they went about the business of taking over the docks. Florino was a prime suspect in the, it's an infamous murder, the Peter Pano murder. Uh, in 1931, and then also the killing of another labor guy named Alfred Parisi. Perino, the father, Giuseppe Perino, he was a short, squat guy, and he had another son, Carmine, who in 1930, this is right after his father died, slashed his wife's face with a razor blade uh, in an argument they had. Uh, later on, he would be murdered later that year in uh, Bath Beach. Uh, the killers saw him walking down the street. Who knows? It was a mob thing. And they chased him. He tried to cut across the block into an alley. And they cut him down with shotguns. Uh, Tony Perino, this is Giuseppe's son, became one of the Colombo's biggest earners. And uh, his group consisted of his brother, Joe the Whale Perino, his sons, Louis Bucci Perino and Josie Perino, and their nephew, Joey Perino, who together developed this one of organized crime's biggest money-making uh, rackets after narcotics, and that was um, in labor racketeering, uh, porn. But it, it, this is before you could, for you benefit of you young people, you could see porn on a computer. I mean, porn now is, my God, it's everywhere. You have to understand, in those days, it just wasn't everywhere. There were what we called dirty bookstores. Uh, the mob usually owned those. They produced the dirty magazines that went in there. They went over to Europe and got them and brought them in. They produced all the films. If a person wanted to see a dirty film, a porn film in those days, uh, they had to know somebody, and then they had to have a machine, a projector. You had to put it on a projector and, and watch it. It wasn't, you know, there was no DVD or any of that stuff. So it was a big process. But the mob owned all the mechanisms that made it happen. Do you see? They own the theaters from the old days, from the Prohibition. Uh, they could distribute it. They could sell it in their porn bookstores. Uh, so when Deep Throat, this $22,000 movie, took off, it really took off. I mean, it was, uh, 
it became mainstream. The star of the film, Linda Lovelace, the, the daughter of a New York City cop, for a brief time anyway, she, you know, sort of became mainstream. Uh, uh, she appeared in Las Vegas with Sammy Davis Jr., um, that sort of thing. She lasted for a while, but... Uh, but, and she didn't make a penny. No one made a penny on this. The actors, the director, nobody made anything. Uh, the Perinos controlled various parts of the adult and porn industries in New York, L.A., and South Florida, which is where you want it to be. So they had bookstores, peep shows, and these adult movie houses, as we used to call them. Um, there was actually a separate theater, and that's all they showed were dirty movies. Um, you'd see guys with raincoats and hats and sunglasses going in there at night. But after... Well, not completely, but after a Deep Throat hit, it became sort of chic for people to go to this thing. Regular folk would go in and see these films. The Perino, Joe Perino, also produces another smash porn hit called The Devil and Miss Jones. Uh, he did that out of his California operations. Then their world all sort of fell apart. In 1975, Anthony and Joe were convicted for conspiring to distribute Deep throw. The government really cracked down, so it was a, a federal offense to try to sell through the mail, and that's how they got him. It was really sort of a technicality. In 1976, Anthony was convicted of conspiracy to ship obscene materials, deep throw, and to distribute it. But he took off. He jumped bail. He disappeared for five years and went to Italy. But in 1981, his health was failing, and he turned himself in. Uh, in 1982 in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. He was sentenced to 10 months in prison, 15,000 in fines, um, and then uh, sometime for jumping his bail. His two sons were arrested in February 1979 for their work on Aero Film and Video. This is the distributing arm for Deep Throat and a lot of other films. The government just wanted a piece of these guys, and they got them on all these little teeny laws that were built around the distribution of pornography. Uh, so it happens that one day there was a dispute between the Perino brothers. Anthony Perino, Tony Perino, complains to the Colombo top brass that his family um, is stealing from him and their board, therefore stealing from the Colombo management. So Carmine Persico hears this and he says, well, just kill them all. Hit team was put together. Joe Russo, John Minerva, Vincent Angelio, Frank Sparkaco, uh, Anthony Russo were all these guys that got together to kill uh, the Perinos who had been stealing from the mob. They met uh, at uh, Joe Tomasello's Avenue Club. I put that uh, picture of him for you where they had shotguns stashed. So on January 4, 1982, the two, the father and son Perinos were told to come to a meeting. They wanted to discuss deep throat money, what was going on. So they had, they took him out of the city and then the Perinos spotted the guys with the shotguns and they took a run for it. Uh, the gunman chased him down the street. Anthony's brother, Joe Sr. and now Joe Jesus, they went into a residential area in Graves and Brooklyn and they got shot. Joe Jr. was killed and Joe Sr. got it in the buttocks and was paralyzed. But I understand that after a few years, he could walk again. Uh, but it was a really bad, bad hit. He was in serious condition for about a year. Then one of those shells hit a woman named uh, Veronica Zura. She had been a former Catholic nun in Brooklyn. Her job was to, she dedicated 10 years of her life to helping Italian immigrants who couldn't read or write and know how to handle immigration into the U.S., uh, she was from Brazil. She was an Italian. And she left the convent and married some guy. A shotgun pellet uh, went through her front porch and then punched through the bottom part of a tin door and then went up and it hit her in the face, hit her in the head and killed her. Um, the hit guys didn't do too well either. Jimmy Angelino, who went on to come consigliere, was killed in New Jersey in 1988. John Minerva was killed uh, just in a car outside a diner in 1992.